Dallas is for foodies. At least that's the opinion of today's guest, Sarah Blaskovich. Sarah is the senior food reporter for the Dallas Morning News, and she reports on restaurants, bars, and culture in North Texas. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to the podcast. So maybe we could start talking a little bit about your podcast. Please. Yes, we have a podcast called Eat, Drink, DFW. It's about restaurants, bars, and okay. other food-related news. Um, and it is a weekly podcast uh, produced by the Dallas Morning News. And me and several other reporters and editors who write about food um, talk on this podcast. It comes out Thursday mornings. Okay. So you guys are filming weekly, talking about... We are. Yeah, and it's, it's whatever is, first of all, on our minds. So sometimes we do wacky taste tests, <laughs> okay. you know, for interesting ingredients that are out on the market. But also we talk through stories that we thought were interesting or unique. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we argue over what's good and not good <laughs> in the industry, which is really fun. Um, but it's a cool way to be human people, you know, who have kids and dogs and lives outside of work, but then right. also have these really you know, interesting jobs where we get to eat for a living and talk to chefs and yeah. food personalities every single day. Yeah. So what does a day in the life of a food reporter look like? It is never the same, okay. which I think is like the best thing ever. Um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm never in the same place on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. So a day in the life is, is often, first of all, waking up and making sure that I didn't miss any major news from the night before when it comes to okay. food. Um, and then usually my day starts by sharing whatever story has already been posted. I do a lot of writing news um, if it can wait until the next morning. Sometimes we publish stories at five, six, seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. so that we can kind of share them all day long. Like uh, recently, we posted a story about 11 pizza joints that were named by the Washington Post as some of the best in Texas. Oh, and wow. so that was a story that yeah. went live early in the morning and then we can kind of share it all day. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, yeah, a day always consists of lunch or dinner at a restaurant. Wow. Pretty much five so days a week. it's a lot of eating. It's a lot of eating, yes. Um, and sometimes, though, visits to those restaurants are places that aren't open yet. So sometimes it's not eating. Sometimes it's wearing a hard hat and closed-toed <laughs> shoes. Okay, yeah. Not kidding, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and taking a tour through a space that's going to be something. And mm -hmm. having the chef or the owner uh, tell me about what they envision there. And that's exciting because that becomes a news story that's a little bit um, aspirational, right? Mm -hmm. This person says, I can see an Italian restaurant in this space and here's going to be the wood fired grill and here's going to be the pasta making station and none of it is there. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's up, just a dream. Yes. It's up to them to explain it to me and hopefully for me to tell their story, you know, accurately and interestingly to, to show readers that someday in this neighborhood on this corner, mm -hmm. here's what we envision it will be. And then when that restaurant opens, usually a week or a couple of days prior to the actual opening date, mm -hmm. I'll go back with a photographer. We'll try some food. I'll ask some more questions. Why are the walls this color? Yeah. Why is that photo hung there? Um, why are these three dishes really special to you or your family? And then I will write a news story that explains what that place is. Um, and, and the reason why I think any of this is important is because restaurants are part of the fabric of every community. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I want to have you on because it Thank shapes... You. It shapes people's experience of the community. Sure. And I, I've been playing or filming in Plano, and it's funny to me because sometimes people are really wrapped up in their social life, and then they're like, "Hey, I want to move to this brand new community that's in the middle of nowhere." Yeah. And I'm like, um, "But where are you going to eat out?" <laughs> like, this stuff matters. Like McDonald's is great and the go once in an aisle, but like <laughs> it's not going to work for your social social life to to have that or Chick Fil A have those as your only options. Yeah. It for the next five years. I think that um, Dallas and its suburbs are uniquely special in that they they all have these little pockets mm -hmm. that can can make a neighborhood, right? So, um, I mean, I would be hard pressed to find any corner of DFW where I couldn't find something, a cool coffee shop, yeah, you know, an interesting family owned restaurant, a park where you could take your kids, a patio where you should drink some wine. Uh, you know, I think that DFW has so many cool little corners. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I am on the go in my car a lot and it's easy to yes. just like, okay, where can I go to write this offer? 
you know, like, okay, I'd much prefer to go to an independent coffee shop as opposed to Starbucks, even though I can always find one of those. Yeah, and um, in the last, let's say, 10 years, Matt, we've had more independent coffee shops open certainly than ever before. I mean, it is a, wow. it is a great time for independent coffee shops. And, you know, if if you look hard enough, there's, there's probably one near you because mm-hmm. we have them in all the suburbs now. It is not just like, you know, you have to go to Dallas or even you have to go to like a, a very urban part of Dallas like Deep Ellum in order to find a coffee shop they're everywhere now yeah that's super cool yeah i don't even drink coffee but i have a thing with coffee shops well and if you need wi-fi <laughs> if you want hot tea yeah. or iced tea my, or green anything tea or my iced tea i can find it at all these coffee shops totally and I usually think, a good cookie or piece of pie too oh uh, definitely good pastries <laughs> yeah coffee shops are a whole vibe mm-hmm. I, I love to write stories in coffee shops and a, a thing i do sometimes is i will leave a restaurant in a community and find a coffee shop in that same community mm. and write the story about the place in the nearby coffee shop because i i want i always want to if i'm writing about the culture of a place or if i'm writing about what a restaurant is supposed to be i want to be able to capture its essence mm-hmm. and like i'm the messenger here so it's important to me that somebody who spent years building this restaurant you know that i'm telling their story in a way that that fits you know what what they think is accurate yeah that's so true and so it's fun to you know if i'm in mckinney it's fun to find a coffee shop in mckinney and write that story Mm -hmm. and still feel like i'm part you know of that community even though i don't live in mckinney right right so part of your job as a food reporter isn't just eating the food it's like what else does it entail yes great question so um a fair amount is restaurant opening and closing okay. stories. So news on what's happening. Um, then there's a, a there's a section of of food reporting that's um, like the hard news pieces. Who's being sued? Who who made a mistake <laughs> yeah. and is going to jail? <laughs> yeah, I guess um, it's part of life. And right. And then who, you know, some of the sad stuff, like did, did a restaurant catch fire? Is everybody mm. okay? Is there a restaurant worker th- who is beloved, who is battling an illness? You know, so um, there's kind of that hard news element. And then um, we always try to tell the stories of the people behind the restaurant. So I think there's people mm-hmm. stories. And I would argue that most restaurant stories are people stories. Anyway, um, somebody created that place. Somebody loved it enough to sign the lease, to create the menu, Mm -hmm. to pick the tile. And so, um, and even the workers, not just the owners, but also, you know, who's going to be the chef, who are the line cooks and what's interesting about them. We try to feature those kind of people. Um, And then uh, the other part of the job would be um, like trending stories. So, If there are a spate of new coffee shops that open Mm -hmm. in a specific community or across DFW, I might create a list of those interesting places and give you a little glimpse inside each. And then we also want lists of other, you know, interesting stuff. Great burgers in Dallas, interesting brunch spots, where to take your dog, you know, to eat on a patio, (laughs) kid friendly restaurants. I have kids who are three and seven years old and we do take them to restaurants quite a bit Uh, responsibly. Of course, there are places you shouldn't take your kids and we don't do that. Um, You know, we don't take our kids to fancy evenings out my husband and I you know get a babysitter that's for probably that. a good rule <laughs> yeah and I think um you know there's a fine line we need to know where to take kids and where not to mm-hmm. and DFW has all kinds of great kid-friendly spots yeah, we're a very friendly family friendly city absolutely especially the suburbs there are so many great places to take your kids but you know Dallas is getting better at it too so we do write a lot of those lists we like to think that our first job is to inform people mm-hmm. and educate people but then also entertain them with the knowledge that we think we have about the communities around Dallas yeah that's super cool it's fun I mean I think I have the best job in the building well yeah it's it's great I mean I, I can't complain I've been at the Dallas we also get to not be in years. the building very often that's right <laughs> get to leave and go eat yeah when I when I am in the building I'm usually not eating but you can't eat all day of course so do you ever have times when you're just like I just don't want to eat out another meal uh sure yes sometimes it's like wow I should really eat vegetables <laughs> Because part of the job, I think that a lot for you myself. Know, yeah, and I, I don't know that I always do it, Matt. But I, um, if I go to a place that's known for its enchiladas, you mm-hmm. better believe I'm eating enchiladas for that meal. Yeah, even if I'd really prefer a salad, I, I think I think it's irresponsible, honestly, to go to a place that wants to be known for something and say I've been there, mm-hmm. you know, and then not do the thing. So you go to the chicken fried steak place, or you go to the comfort food restaurant, and you eat some southern food covered in gravy. Yeah. I love this too, but there does come a moment where I think. I should really I, eat at home. I was just thinking the best of burger list. Like, it's like that might be a lot of burgers over it's, the course yeah, of a week it, or a month. It's not great for you. <laughs> no. um, 
But my husband is an excellent cook, funny enough. I love to cook, but I'm sort of an in the weeds cook. Like if Mm. you let me, I'll cook for three or four hours from a long recipe. Oh, wow. And like really like love it. Mm -hmm. My husband is the pro who in 20 minutes can whip up a really great dinner that's either required a couple of ingredients from the grocery store or even we might have the stuff at home. And so funny enough, most of the healthy meals we eat are at home and not cooked by me. Right, right. (laughs) I I joke that I don't really cook. I'm more like put together. Which I'll is I'll be like, I'm just making fine. a salad or I'm eating chicken and broccoli. So it's like it's, not really cooking. But I, I mean, I think that's how a lot of people eat. Like, mm-hmm. I always want to remember that as we write about restaurants that will cost $300 for a couple, mm-hmm. for instance, I, I we need to remember that like many, many Dallas Morning News readers also on Tuesday are eating a sandwich Mm -hmm. at dinner, standing up while they're also feeding their kids who then need to be put in pajamas and go to bed. You know, so there's there's this delicate balance of like, how can we tell stories about interesting places that are hot, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. and then how um, can we inform people about the neighborhood spots, about the inexpensive spots? You know, we can't all do business dinners and lunches. Every day, it's just not reality. It's easy to get seduced by like the fancy, you know, flashy restaurants. It's the same thing with real estate. Like people are like, you know, oh, this new house, like we can't afford that house. Like, right. We know, don't all live in five million dollar homes. Can, you can go open a house, but you just, you can't live there. Right. And it's not a bad thing, but it, you know, it's easy as an agent too to always want to promote like the fanciest homes and stuff, but everybody needs a place to live. Everybody needs yep. to eat. Yep. We uh, need to live inside our realities. Different. Yeah. It looks different for people. So I want to back up a little bit. Are you you're originally from Dallas? I am. I was born and raised in Plano. Okay. So we love Plano. Yeah, me too. Um, We'll talk about that. So you're, you're not living in Plano anymore, though. Correct. Your family has I, yes, relocated. I went, so I lived there for 18 years. I graduated from Plano Senior High. Okay. Knew I wanted to be a journalist since I was probably an elementary schooler. Wow. And I got an internship at the Dallas Morning News when I was 17. So I got a little piece yeah. of my hometown newspaper. And that's, you know, I wanted to work there. Mm-hmm. So I went away to journalism school. I went to the University of Missouri Journalism School for four years. And then I moved right back to Dallas, but moved to Dallas proper at mm-hmm. that point. So I haven't lived in Plano since I was 18. Um, although I had family who lived there for a little bit. Now I don't have family in Plano, but I do have family in Frisco. So, okay. you know, move from one suburb to another. Yeah. And, um, and I. I really I learned to love Dallas food later. I didn't I didn't grow up in a food family. Okay. I you know my parents didn't create you know expansive exciting dinners. We ate like people in the suburbs ate. You know my mom cooked healthy chicken and vegetables for most. <laughs> we didn't go to a lot of restaurants mm-hmm. growing up. Restaurants are expensive. Yeah. And so it it wasn't until later that I even became a food reporter. I was a hard news reporter. Oh, wow. And okay. sometimes I still think I'm a breaking news reporter like with a food problem. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. like I, because the news of food is really exciting for mm-hmm. me. The openings, the closings, the what's okay. happening right now. And that's a, that's a breaking news reporter's brain that happens to be focused on the restaurant okay. industry. So I learned about wine and food and you know sous vide chicken at home when everybody else did Mm -hmm. you know after college as i learned to cook and i learned to love restaurants then okay um so one thing i like about that is that i think i eat like a regular person i am not a chef i've never been to culinary school i don't plan to go you know and i think it's possible to be a reporter who can cover that industry without having an an actual background working in food Mm -hmm. although i'll say one thing i worked at a bar all through college and i think that everybody in their life should work in a restaurant or a bar it 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 builds character Mm -hmm. it it helps you understand people and customer service and hard work and work on your feet uh, and think on your feet and i just i loved it i thought it was so fun and sometimes i was serving my friends pitchers of beers but oftentimes i was serving you know professors and i i worked at a like a beer and burger spot across the street from the journalism school wow uh, right by missouri's campus yeah and so i i really learned to love restaurant people in Mm -hmm. that job i think and so when i interview people in restaurants of all levels I understand a little bit of what kind of job they have because I did that job. I did the lowest jobs Mm -hmm. in restaurants, you know, as a college server. And so um, I think it was then that I started to love bars specifically, that they could be meetup spots, Mm -hmm. that they could be places for people to convene. It's not always even about drinking. It's about it's about a sense of place. Mm -hmm. The location. Yeah. And the the hangout of it. And I still today I love bars. I think that those are cool places to meet your friends, whether they drink or not, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's a it's a good place to have a meeting. Uh, I meet people at bars to interview them all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, yeah, that's probably, I could think of way better, way worse spots that you would, totally. you would do that. Yeah. So how did you make the transition from hard news to food? It was it's almost like a much softer side of, of uh, the news. Yes, absolutely. It was a, um, it was really opportunity more than anything else, uh, or maybe lack of opportunity, I should say. When I graduated, we were in a recession. And so journalism jobs were not everywhere. Mm-hmm. So I got some smaller jobs working here or there at community newspapers, at a magazine, and those weren't really quite the thing yet, but I was kind of building, right? I was 23, yeah. 24. And then I got a job at a company called Pegasus News, which was an arts and entertainment website where we were writing about music, movies, food, stuff to do, okay. bars. And I was in my mid 20s doing all that stuff in my personal life. Mm-hmm. And then so I started covering those things professionally, editing stories about it and writing the stories myself. And there was really something to that. Um, and then as luck would have it, the Dallas Morning News bought that little company wow. in 2012. And so the joke is I came through the side door at the Dallas Morning News. I wanted to come through the front door. <laughs> I came through the side door. Hey, you still got in the door. And they agreed to keep me. And I'd already worked there for a summer mm-hmm. at 17 years old, which do not get me wrong, I was doing anything they would let me do as a 17 year old intern. (laughs) But uh, you know, I really loved the newspaper and grew up with it. Mm -hmm. And so now I had a job in the entertainment section uh, starting in 2012. So I did all kinds of stuff. I wrote about restaurants. I wrote about, uh, I went to concerts and reviewed them. Mm. I wrote about festivals. I got a, did a fair amount of editing. And then in 2019, so after having been there for seven years, um, I asked to take a step back and be a full-time food reporter. I had one daughter and we were just about to, we hoped have a second daughter, mm-hmm. which we later did. But I didn't know how to manage my world being an editor of a bunch of people in the entertainment section. So I thought, I think I can bring value to this company just by covering restaurants, Mm -hmm. but I want to be a full-time reporter. It is not something that a woman in her late 20s or early 30s asks to do, which is, can I take a step back? Mm -hmm. Can I, can I not be a manager right now? Um, And I think it was an unpopular decision at the time. You know, I was sort of maybe headed to manage more people. Mm -hmm. And I said, in this moment in my time, what I really love is restaurants and food. I know there is an audience for it because we watch people read these stories, interact with them, care about them. And I can be more ingrained in this industry if you'll let me. And they did. That's awesome. So I became a full-time food reporter in 2019 instead of doing all that other stuff. Um, My second daughter was born in 2020. The world shut down. Yeah. Uh, a and lot we, of restaurants We were shut stuck down at too. home with an infant and, and yes, a serious job that now was less about restaurant openings and much more about restaurant closings. Mm-hmm. It was also about economics and about sickness and about safety. Yeah. You know, all those like hard news moments um, became my day to day when it came to restaurant reporting. We were worried that if we went into a restaurant that you could get sick. And then how do restaurant workers stay safe working with other people in restaurants. You yeah. know, we wrote all those news stories at the beginning of the pandemic and I I hated the time, but I loved that. I felt like we were helping people. Mm-hmm. Felt like we were sharing information that everyone needed at a time that was really scary. Right. And that's what the news is about. Absolutely. Yes, it was it felt really like public service journalism. Mm-hmm. And you know, we still do a lot of that when it comes to safety and food and all that stuff. But um now that we're mostly on the other side of the pandemic, we're also it's a lot more fun. Right. Yeah, yeah, we can sure. just talk about flashy restaurants and restaurant design and steakhouses mm-hmm. and cupcakes and pizza. Yeah. <laughs> cupcakes and pizza. Yeah, exactly. It's funny because it brought back memories to me when you talked about COVID and restaurants. Because yeah. I am a bachelor and I have tend to eat out a lot. It's, uh-huh. just, it's easy. I'm on the go. And I was like, man, I'm going to have to like cook for myself right all of a sudden. And this is not good. Yep. And then and then I was like, OK, well, I'm going to on Tuesdays and Fridays, I'm just going to go get takeout uh-huh. consistently just to support the restaurants that I like. And I even go to Studio Movie Grill and get takeout from there because even though it's like not yes. a normal restaurant, I was like, I just want to support them I mean, and buy food during this time. I think that time. mind is really important because and we watched other people do it, too. Like the the line was, if you like this restaurant, you need to support it. Yeah, because and that's always true. Small businesses in the restaurant industry are never like swimming in cash. Yeah, that's just how that works in good times. In bad times, though, those places can close overnight Mm -hmm. Um, and the margins were just not there to be closed for even a week, much less 
a month, two months, three months, a year. Yeah. And so we did watch a lot of our favorite places close, but so many of these restaurateurs figured it out. Mm -hmm. They were scrappy. You know, they they cut their costs. Unfortunately, a lot of lower level restaurant workers lost their jobs. Yeah. Um, but we saw some chefs retain their jobs so that they could make takeout food. But it mattered that people like you said, I'm going to the Tex-Mex place around the corner because I love it. I'm getting lunch from there today. Yeah. I mean, that those dollars, that, that $30 order and the next person's $55 order, it's like those single-handedly saved restaurants mm -hmm. or didn't if people chose not to. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. And we were pretty lucky in Texas we relative were. to some other states. Like I think, like California, I think restaurants took a real hit there. Yeah, and we so we lost about 18% of the restaurants wow. in DFW in the first year of COVID. So March 2020 to March 2021. Wow. Now, the projections were, I saw like, 33%, a third of restaurants were gonna close. Uh -huh. And in the worst of times, the guess was maybe 50%. So if you look at those numbers, 18% yeah. is better. Um, but, but. So one in five, basically. Yes. Yeah. And if you, if your favorite restaurant is in that 18%, 18% feels bigger. Correct. You know, because that's just, or or worse, if it was your restaurant, mm -hmm. if you were the owner of that place. Um, it was a really tough time, but Texas did do better than most other places. And then the aftermath of that, like the real estate moment of that, is now we are seeing out-of-town restaurant owners um, from uh, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, New York City, mm -hmm. want to move to Dallas. So in the past couple of years, we've seen more out of town restaurants sign leases in Dallas than ever before. Interesting. And it's because of the way, you know, that business was kept more open mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And if they were in cities or states where they couldn't do business in the way they wanted. Yeah, I had an entrepreneur on the show early on, and he speculated that a lot of restaurants and businesses were going to try out their concepts in Dallas. Because it's a more affordable cost. Like they can get yep. the real estate, they can get prime real estate more affordably, labor is a little less expensive. And then if it worked here, they would move it out to the more expensive areas. I don't know if that's true. It was a very interesting hypothesis it, to think about that. No, I think it is true. And there's been an old wives' tale, which, you know, put an asterisk on that because it's kind of a tale. But <laughs> the idea is if you can survive in Dallas and its suburbs, that the likelihood of a restaurant surviving in other markets is high. Hmm. So there's this mix of urban and suburban. Like you're saying, the cost of living is relatively low. So you can also, a lot of out of town restaurateurs can afford to bring their people here and they think they can find laborers to work yep. in their restaurants. Now, I would say we are we are short on um, line cooks and higher yeah. level chefs. And it's been interesting, you know, you think like, how do you solve a problem like that? Where do you get more chefs in a region that already has a lot of restaurants? And <laughs> that is a great question. You, you have yeah. to kind of make them right. Mm -hmm. And so um, something that's so fascinating to me is that um, Dallas College, which is a community college, they have a pretty strong culinary mm. program and it is a community college program, not a private culinary school, which would be much more expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, last I checked, and you know, this has been probably a year, Dallas College was saying they could turn out something like 300 chefs a year from their program. So the idea being wow. um, they can train people to do this work that is um, that is important and needed, but then could you put those 300 people back into our market, mm -hmm. right? Or are they going to be stolen by, are they going to move to, you know, Miami and New York City and LA yeah. and Vegas? Maybe. Um, but that's cool to me, right? <clears throat> because if you have a labor problem, how do you solve it? This community college says, well, we're going to solve it locally. Mm -hmm. We're going to teach people how to cook and then we're going to place them in restaurants here. That's great. It's cool. Yeah, it's super cool. I didn't even realize about that. Yeah. And I mean, Otherwise, what you're going to have is more unskilled people working in restaurants. Um, and many restaurant jobs can be trained on the job. Right. So don't get me wrong. Um, it, many levels of restaurants, you can have somebody who's never done it before and you can teach them. Mm -hmm. Some of these higher level chefs and like career line cooks, especially at more expensive restaurants, often you want those people to have gone to culinary school. There's a, there's a skill set there. Yeah. I and, mean, really, yeah. there, this is a skill set that, for instance, I don't have. Me neither. You know, I mean, <laughs> to say that with certainty. Uh, I talk to a lot of um, civic groups, and one thing that comes up a lot is like this idea of like restaurants are getting more expensive, and it feels like we have to tip at every corner, right? At the coffee shop, <laughs> yes. at the. Um, and, and I heard it's called guilt tipping. It's like yeah, when you go to that's a walk. Such a good phrase. When, when you go, this drives me nuts when I go to a place where I effectively serve myself, and then the options are set at like twenty, twenty-five, and thirty percent tip, and I was like, "You're just handing me a cup of coffee." 
that seems that like you're a lot. gonna have to do anyways it's, and you yep. want a 30 percent tip yep. you know? no i i absolutely agree with you but then you think about it this way and here's one thing i tell people especially when it comes to higher end restaurants but i guess you can use it the coffee shop analogy too um those people are doing a job that we don't do by choice yeah you know, they yeah. are they are serving you something. You you do, chose not to work at a coffee shop. You chose to be a realtor. You know, I chose not to work in a restaurant. I chose to be a journalist. And so one thing I do believe in, though, is paying people for, oh, yeah. for their skill. And so when when people say, man, everything is more expensive. Yes, ingredients are more expensive. You know, we're, we're dealing with some inflation. People are more expensive, yeah. too. And um, like somebody asked me the other day, do you think that you need to tip if you buy an expensive bottle of wine? Do you pay 20%? for the whole meal, including that $100 bottle of wine? Hmm. My answer is yes, because people are serving you and you've got a sommelier who probably talked to you about that wine. And the long and the short of it is, if you can afford to go to that place. You can afford the extra pay, $20 yeah, tip. Yeah, pay the people a 20 to 25% yeah. tip for doing a job that you've chosen not to do because they're doing it well. That's another question. I had never thought about it. And I, I, my strategy was always the lazy strategy of like just 20%. Yes. Because it's easy math. Yep. Right? If it's really good, I'll just round it up. Yep. I think 20% is a fine number. I think some people are stretching toward 25%. Um, Interesting. But the tip, the tip structure in the U.S. is kind of messy because mm -hmm. we consider, many people consider tips as a um, reward. Yeah. Right. If you've done a good job, I'm going to give you a number. If you've done a bad job, maybe I'll give you nothing. And that's really sticky because servers make two dollars and 13 cents an hour. Really? To this day. That has been true for a long time. Years and years and years. Two dollars and 13 cents wow. because servers make tips. Right. And that number, that hourly number has not budged. So one important thing to think about is like it isn't actually a reward. It is their salary. It's part of their compensation. Yeah. And so if someone has done a bad job, it's a good idea, you know, to very politely tell that person, maybe talk to a manager before you write your ugly wow. Yelp review yeah. too. You know, that doesn't help. Two dollars. and I had no idea. Yeah. And so when I think about restaurant servers and what they make and the jobs they do and the difficulties they face during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, I just think if someone can be generous yeah, it, it's the better way to go, even though it hurts a little yeah. bit to know That's that everything life costs thing. If you can more. Give, give. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just I also really believe in restaurant people. Mm -hmm. They they, they um, I, I have the pleasure of talking to people who own restaurants and run restaurants every single day. And they have a heart of hospitality that not everybody does. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to serve people and make them happy. Not everybody can say that about no, their job. A lot of job. people don't want to do that. Right. And so, um, and it's it's sort of contagious to like be around these people all the time and watch them constantly want to know, are you happy? Mm -hmm. Is the food that I made with my own hands for you making you happy? You know, a lot of good restaurant people, this is how they live 100% of their day. Wow. And it's really like, it's lovely. So the pandemic was hard to watch those people suffer. And then it was really neat to watch them succeed. Mm -hmm. In between episodes, stay up to date on all things home and lifestyle with my weekly newsletter, Into the Weekend with Matt, where I share the latest real estate updates, new videos from our team, and advice for both buyers and sellers alike. To sign up, go to hastingsre.com slash ITW. That's H-A-I-S-T-I-N-G-S-R-E dot com slash ITW. And I think here in D Dallas and DFW, we have a very healthy you may tell me otherwise, but I think we have a very healthy restaurant industry. We do have a healthy restaurant industry. We have, last I checked, about 14,000 restaurants in Dallas, That's Fort Worth, so and many. Arlington. Yes, and I i mean, it's like a personal goal to get to all of them, but I do have to say out loud, I haven't. <laughs> It'd be pretty hard. Yeah, but I am working <laughs> on eating a lot everywhere. Does that 14,000 include like a chain that may have 10 locations yeah. across the metro? Yeah. Okay, so you could, you could this is maybe these... knock out 10 restaurants at a time yeah, that's with a fair those chains. Yes, um, but the, the numbers come from the government. So yeah. like they you know, they count, they can also tell you, you know, the number of, I don't know, hair salons and everything else. So this yeah. is one of those like, must be like census census. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Bureau of Labor and Statistics okay. data. So I check it every year and it changes every year and it's like a year or two behind. Mm -hmm. So that 14,000 was, I believe, a, I think that's a 2021 or 2022 figure. Um, more restaurants are opening every day, but, but we are a a market. So, you know, as restaurants open, the ones that can't sustain or weren't popular enough to succeed close. They go away. You know, and so it's we dynamic. watched that market fluctuate. I would have told you pre pandemic that we were over restauranted in DFW. We had too many restaurants mm -hmm. for the number of people that were here. Um, 
I didn't want to see restaurants close, don't get me wrong, but we saw 18% close uh, during the pandemic. And then we've very quickly climbed back up to pretty close to pre-pandemic okay. numbers. And the population's grown at the same time. Yeah, so uh, so the market is is shifting in response to what people want and don't want. Yeah. And in a world where restaurants closed and then opened with fervor uh, mid and post-pandemic. Okay, it's interesting. I and mean, when people will be like, oh, the economy's so bad. And I look around in Plano and I'm like, I have to wait in line to sit at the bar sometimes. So yeah. like yeah. the economy, how's the economy bad? Everybody's eating out. Yeah, and Plano <laughs> specifically is of interest to me because like I said, I was born here and I wouldn't say Plano had an interesting restaurant yeah, I situation uh, in the 80s and 90s. Okay. And now I was also not from a family that ate in a lot of restaurants and there were plenty of cute mom and pop shops mm -hmm. and, and many chains. Like we were a family in the 80s and 90s who loved chilies on a special occasion. Yeah. Like this okay. was our yeah. brand. And yeah. Uh, now, oh, you're in California, so it was different different chains, but same idea, it, right? Yes, yeah. and uh, it was also the era of chain restaurants. It's a beautiful time for chains to grow, mm -hmm. and I am now uh, a, a strong source of mine is the co-founder of Chili's. His name is Larry Levine. He started Chili's, what was oh, it, 50 wow. years ago, and I have lunch with him every other month. Oh, cool, And cool. we talk about the industry. We talk about which restaurants he yeah. thinks are interesting. Uh, we talk about his journey through restaurants over five decades. He's a fascinating person. I bet. And it and you know, Chili's was like if you would have told you know thirteen year old me that I was going to be having lunch with a guy who started the place that I thought had the yeah. best fancy chicken tenders in the whole city. Right, right. Yeah, you know, that would have been huge. Yeah. Um, but Plano is, in my opinion, not really known for its restaurants. No. As I was growing up there, it was known for its schools. That's why mm -hmm. my parents moved from Buffalo, New York to Plano, Texas, to okay. raise us there in yep. the good schools. My dad worked for EDS and Frito-Lay, which were close by. Yeah. Um, but I wrote a story um, years ago, maybe a decade ago, called How Plano Got Cool. That's mm -hmm. the headline. And the idea is that the Plano that I remember growing up with, a wholesome, great place, you know, to dance and have soccer games and go to school, now has become a restaurant spot. So much so that people in Plano do not need to drive to Dallas in order to eat no. well. Not at all. In fact, you might drive north to yeah. Frisco or over to the colony instead of driving to Dallas. And uh, there's one restaurant company that I think really made a big change in Plano, and it's the the group that started Whiskey Cake. Okay. So they started Whiskey Cake and 60 Vines. And, and so they started those here. They started them in Plano and not in Dallas. I assumed that they moved here from Dallas. Yeah, I, and, yeah. and that would be natural to assume. That is the progression. Okay. Right? You start in the bigger city, you move to the Burbs. That's not what they did. They started on the tollway in Plano. It became popular enough that it expanded down to Dallas, where Dallas people like that brand too <laughs> and may not know that it didn't start there, <laughs> which is fine. Who yeah. cares? Who right? cares? It's good food. Yeah. yeah, somebody like me is following all these footsteps, but I know everybody at home is not. They're and just that's, like, I like this restaurant. Yes. Um, but they really created uh, approachable, beautiful, relatively affordable, cool restaurants mm -hmm. in the suburbs. And then from there, um, Frisco, Plano, The Colony, McKinney, Allen are unto its own, their own region. Yeah. And in fact, um, people in Frisco do not like it when I call it a suburb. In a news story, <laughs> they believe this is not a suburb. This is I still think it's a suburb, spot. but I wouldn't say that about Plano. <laughs> I I do too. I mean, I live in get Dallas. Bigger, they'll get bigger than um, Plano soon, I it's, think. Anyway, so yes, and um, you know the Frisco argument too is they have their own sports teams. You know, there's there's a whole thing going on in Frisco, mm -hmm. and then the restaurants have built up around it. So in Plano, we watched Whiskey Cake and its other restaurants expand. We watched downtown Plano in East Plano get yeah. cooler, mm -hmm. more interesting restaurants, um, and then. Shops at Legacy was a big deal when it opened. And now, of course, Legacy West yeah. is its newer, cooler counterpart. But those were major moments where you could walk in a district and go to good restaurants and feel like you didn't need to leave the city. Yeah. And then in Frisco, we watched the star in Frisco happen. We watched PGA Omni Resort open recently, mm -hmm. and there are 13 restaurants on that property. Wow, 13. I didn't really so many. Yeah, and you know, that that golf resort is designed to, it was explained to me as like Plano's, you know, Pebble Beach. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's not just some place to take your kids or even for North Texans to go staycation, although they will. The idea is like golf people from the world over yes. will want to come to Frisco. And what do they need? Food. Correct. They need an ice cream shop yeah. for their kids. They need a like Katie Trail Ice House like barbecue patio mm -hmm. place. They need a steakhouse that's cool. And they have all that just yeah. on that one right. campus. 
it's it's so fascinating amazing. to watch. Um, and then um, the colony at Grandscape. Mm -hmm. So I, I am fascinated by this development because they are finding restaurateurs from like across the literal world, yeah, including one from India called Windmills. It is a brewery and restaurant, mm -hmm. and the people who developed Grandscape. Uh, handpicked those spots and there's Portillo's which is the famous Chicago hot dog and Italian yet. beef uh, sandwich place. about the weight and I just was like I can't I like I can't do the weight. live tweeted my weight um, <laughs> for fun. And how long was it? It was about an hour. Okay, this was right when bad. it opened. Yeah. But I mean like I stood in line and took million selfies of myself as I got closer <laughs> and like status updates on where I am and I set a timer so that I could see how long from start yeah. to finish it was a total blast this is a day in the life of a food right, reporter right. for I instance just, yeah. this is the weird stuff that I do for fun at lunchtime um but yeah they got Portillo's to open there they got um, a place called Davio's which is this cool kind of date night yeah. Italian spot um, and then there's a bunch of kid-friendly things to do in Grandscape. So the colony is no longer this bedroom community, you know, no. where you might travel someplace else. It is now, uh, there's a truck yard there. Yeah. Which is I such like a fun place. I like that one better than the original one because it's more spacious. I like that truck yard better than the original one too. And I can walk to the original one from my house. Yeah. <laughs> And yet still, I like the one in the colony yeah. better. Uh, I can take my kids. It, I've taken my kids to the one in Dallas, and it feels like you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. The I've, one there, of course, you can The colony is teeming with, with well-behaved children, yeah. you know, eating popsicles and corny dogs and listening to music with yeah. their parents. Yeah. There is so much going it's on in Collin cool, County. It's such a cool um, development there. It, yes, it is. And I, I've heard people complain about the parking. Um, here's the deal with it. You park on the outside and you walk to the inside. That's the flavor of the place. Yeah. And, you know, we do parking lots here in North Texas. Right. And I'm not mad about it because we yeah. all like to drive our cars everywhere Too, you know, like like <laughs> Part so, of living somebody who Texas. doesn't want all those parking lots. Well, great. Then then get yourself there without your car. Yeah. But so far, we haven't really created the infrastructure or the interest. Yeah. In doing that. I met somebody who lived in Plano a few years ago and they're like, I got rid of my car. I take Uber everywhere. Wow. And I was like. Really? Is this is like a practical joke? Because it just didn't feel. Yeah. I was like, I, I, maybe in Dallas proper, you could get away with that. I was like, I just don't. He's like, I have to be patient sometimes. Like, because I don't always get a ride when I think I'm going to get a ride. I was like, Ooh, that's that's risky. I love that self-control. And yeah. the rest of us aren't programmed that way no. yet. No. Um, but I do love a walkable neighborhood, too. Like, I, I like the idea. And this is more common maybe in Dallas than in the suburbs. But I like the idea that you can go to a neighborhood park your car or get out of your ride share and then, you know, walk up and down the block, have mm -hmm. dinner here, have wine at the place next door, maybe grab a final cocktail a couple of doors down with a friend. And Dallas super excels at those neighborhoods, which mm -hmm. each bring a different flavor and personality, in my opinion. Um, and they they bring such a culture and a life to our city that I think has really helped define Dallas. Mm -hmm. What would you say some of the different neighborhood personalities are? Uh, so um, I love this question and I, I love like picking a neighborhood and spending all evening there. So Lower Greenville is a perfect example. Okay. So you've, and if anybody listening remembers Lower Greenville from 20 years ago, <laughs> um, as I do, it was kind of some gritty bars and uh, it, it was not known for its restaurants. Okay. And I'm talking the bottom of Greenville, like lowest Greenville. Um, now it is a restaurant mecca. So it is restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, then maybe a wine bar, mm -hmm. and then another restaurant. And it is um, it is fascinating how that neighborhood has changed. So I love Lower Greenville. I think it is a place, um, it's very popular in the East Dallas area, which is where I live. Um, you know, like a lot of my friends my age go out there mm -hmm. with their kids or with their spouses and kind of hang out up and down the street. Um, and there's just so much to eat there. So a, a huge variety in, um, in price tag and in cuisine, mm -hmm. all up and down the street. It is vibrant during the day. It is vibrant after dark. Uh, it's I love Lower Greenville. Now you've got like go to Deep Ellum, for instance, which is not that far from no, the bottom of Lower, no. Lower Greenville. A little bit um, grittier, a lot more bars, concert venues. There's a corner of Deep Ellum that is now like the nightclub spot. So there's <laughs> I have no idea. Yes, there's club after club for uh you know you can be any age but i was going to say for people generally younger than me um you know who kind of want to club hop mm -hmm. so like wear your best stay out till 2 a.m yeah. kind of stuff um there's there's a half dozen of them right like you you just hop from one to the other yeah 
Then you've got Bishop Arts District. So, you know, arts is in the name and it's generally thought to be a little bit of an artsier neighborhood, but don't get me wrong, very much a food neighborhood mm -hmm. too. And uh, the variety of cuisine there is really cool. So you've got one of Dallas's best restaurants, Lucia, which is an Italian restaurant. Okay. You know, walking distance to a Spanish restaurant, walking distance to an Argentinian restaurant, walking distance to a barbecue joint, yeah. <laughs> and so bars all in between. There, yeah. uh, and some art galleries and some gift shops. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love to walk in Bishop Arts District. There's a lot to see and do, and it feels, you know, just like a vibrant part of town. And it's just down the street from Jefferson, which hasn't changed a lot and then still has a strong Hispanic population around and near it. And with that comes food. Yeah. Right. So you could walk from Bishop Arts to Jefferson and still eat at some really great Mexican and taco shops mm -hmm. right there. Um, so and then let's go to like Knox Street in Dallas. I call it Dallas's hottest food block right now. The rent is higher than it is almost anywhere else in the city. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I, we all remember when the Apple Store opened on Knox. That's kind of the beginning yeah. of the new face. Mm -hmm. So then um, the Weir's Tower was built. So there's a new Weir's and there's a new uh, formerly called Restoration Hardware. Now they call it RH. Okay. Right. Um, but there's so there's a little bit of a design element. There's a yeah. pottery barn and a crate and barrel, Weir's and RH. Um, and then there's restaurants in between all of that. The hottest restaurant of the summer, and I use that word to indicate it's both buzzy and expensive, is Mr. Charles. And it's right at the corner of Knox and uh, Travis. Okay. And this is one of the best design restaurants in the whole city. It is, I mean, they turned it up to 11. There is, there is design all the way to the ceiling. Wow. Like, Italian tapestries hung way up high um, and loud, fun music playing, even though the the place, you know, has this beautiful, expensive Italian build out. Mm -hmm. It is it is fun. It is exciting. It is where you go to, you know, get way dressed up, spend a whole lot of money <laughs> and impress somebody. So this is called Mr. Charles, Mr. Charles. And what makes it so just the whole the whole package makes it the hottest. Yes. Uh, place of the summer. Yeah, yes. So it the the menu is like they say an irreverent play on the classics. So, you know, ninety dollar steaks with an interesting sauce, hmm. lobster thermidor, uh, Wellington. Uh, at an egg salad sandwich to start with caviar on top that's $9. Yeah. And it's tiny. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like really, really little. Yeah. yeah. So like stuff like that. You know, it's just, um, it's fabulous and fun. It's right on the edge of Park Cities and just feels like it serves this um, well-heeled Dallasite, of which part of Dallas is. But as we just went through all the yeah. restaurants, much of Dallas is not. Mm -hmm. um, we just have a lovely mix of all kinds of different food to serve different kinds of people. Now, Mr. Charles comes from the owners of a place called The Charles in the Design District mm -hmm. and a place called El Carlos, also in the Design District. So you see a little bit of synergy here. There's right. The Charles, El Carlos, yeah. and now Mr. Charles. And then they also own a restaurant called Sister on Greenville Avenue in Dallas, okay. over where we were mm -hmm. talking about before. Um, so they built those three, and then Mr. Charles feels kind of like the piece de resistance. It's like this big deal. Mm. that has DNA from all these other places. That's fascinating. The building of those restaurants now that they're at four is is kind of fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's. I take it for granted because it's like, oh, I just go to this restaurant and it's fabulous and yeah. I have a memorable experience, but there's a story behind it. Yeah, and I mean... And there's usually a story behind everything, but people have to have a lot of heart to be willing to start a restaurant. Totally. There's a lot of uncertainty there. Yes. No, and it's, I joke, it's like a blessing and a curse to go to dinner with me because it's like, if you want that story, I know it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't, we could totally just drink wine. <laughs> you know, that's but funny. It's, I love the people behind a restaurant and I've had the pleasure to meet a lot of them, yeah. you know, and get to kind of tell their stories. Mm -hmm. So in Dallas, too, there's some big restaurant groups that, like you mentioned, one, that they have maybe a business of just trying new concepts or yep. creating new concepts. What does that actually look like? Uh, it's a great question. So, um, I think a lot of people, I only have started learning about like how a restaurant is put together. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the restaurant groups that have, you know, call it 10, 15 restaurants, they take on investors for each one. Okay. Um, some, some finance themselves with the money that they've earned from other restaurants, but oftentimes, you know, you take on investors for new restaurants each time. So, um, a connected restaurant owner will ask his or her wealthy friends or, you know, do kind of a fundraise. Mm -hmm and then get people um, invested in opening these new spots. So, and we've got a fair amount of medium-sized restaurant groups in Dallas. So people who don't own one or two or three, you know, they own 10 or 15. Right. 
Which um, makes sense. It's a big city. It does make sense. And um, when a company expands in a smart way, which often means to different suburbs and to different neighborhoods mm -hmm. in Dallas, you can watch the same restaurant flourish elsewhere. Like a great example is Rodeo Goat, a burger joint that I think yeah. is just, it's really we good. We have one Plano now. Yeah, it's not fancy and it's not supposed to be. But um, in my experience, the burgers are just, you know, they're great. And it doesn't matter which one you get. You know, they're well cooked and they're cooked to your liking mm -hmm. even. I went there with, there were seven of us. It was. Um, three of my kids' grandparents and my family of four, and we were ages three to 75. And several people wanted their burgers cooked well or medium mm -hmm. or medium rare, <laughs> right at the same yeah. table. And it's like, all of our burgers came out beautiful and you know the way we wanted, they were all very different. Mm -hmm. And Rodeo Goat has it launched itself in many cities. Like the next place I think it's gonna open is Denton, but you've got them all over the place. So they've, they've found that burgers work in a lot of yeah. spots, which like we knew that, right? Yeah. And then um, it's not too expensive, right? So it's you're not pricing yourself by only being in the richest part of Dallas, which is yeah. a tough business model. Yeah, A lot of restaurateurs don't wanna do that. They wanna be in a lot of spots yeah. safely. Um, and so, but there are other examples beyond Rodeo Goat, but it's just a perfect example of one that, that found its home in some in many spots in DFW, and I think it works yeah. in almost all of them. And we were talking about Velvet Taco the other day, which yes. started in Dallas, but now is a national that's right national chain. Yeah, and when they sold, so Velvet Taco was started in part by the Whiskey Cake and Sixty Vines oh, people. Yeah. It comes back to them, and um, but there are a lot of very well known restaurant creators who had their hands on that model. It's like there were a bunch of smart people mm -hmm. who were involved in that, and um, I mean they sold for millions and millions of dollars you know, to a private equity group. Wow. And it, it that's the dream for some restaurateurs, but it depends on who you are. Some people really wanna make wonderful Italian food at one family owned restaurant mm -hmm. and that's it. Um, some wanna build a Velvet Taco like thing and sell it for a hundred million bucks. Yeah. And then there's a lot of in between too. Some some just wanna create a good burger joint, like that was created by a guy called Shannon Wynn, um, who still lives in the Park Cities area and was, brought up in restaurants and so he owns also flying saucer and um flying fish and meddlesome moth okay yeah. and you know so there's a whole conglomeration of restaurants that are also part of the rodeo goat family uh, and he just wants to open good restaurants around town you yeah. know i don't think he has ambitions of of selling it to a private equity group right so just it, a passion for the industry yeah there's a lot of different ways to be in the restaurant industry but the most common way is the one-off family-owned restaurant? We have more of those than anything else. Yeah, of and that those 14, are the fabric. Thousand are like nine thousand of them. The family-owned. I don't half, know the numbers, maybe. but it's sure. It's it's a lot. I mean, yeah. a lot of these are one-offs. Sometimes two restaurants uh -huh. at most. But yeah, the bulk of the restaurant industry is not these these chain restaurant-minded, you know, or or even ones who want to grow. It's it's a family who makes really good Greek food. Yeah, and I think that's great. Yeah, it may even start it with we have people in our home that like we like cooking Greek food and it we're just starts, gonna start doing it for more people now. It starts a lot like that. In fact, one of my favorite restaurant stories in Dallas, so El Phoenix is Dallas's Dallas Fort Worth's oldest restaurant. Wow, okay. Is it the one right there uh, by Woodall Rogers? Yes, so sort of. The okay. that one's been there for eighty some years. Wow. But it uh, the actual brand is a hundred and some odd years old. 103 or 104 wow. and the original is not there anymore it was in a town in a part of town that um has since been developed kind of near the american airlines center okay. that kind of area but so it, it didn't move far and then it's been right there by the perot museum mm -hmm. for you know eight plus decades um but the story it was started by the martinez family and they their original menu at el phoenix was like spaghetti and oysters rockefeller and it was it was American food, and they thought that's what people wanted from them. Uh -huh. And as the story goes, for family meal, which is what all the restaurant workers make for each other before a shift starts, mm -hmm. they started making Mexican food. The kitchen was mostly Mexican workers, and the family that owned it was Mexican, and they made food that they loved. And I don't know how it shifted but it as the story went it was something like the regulars wanted to know what they ate mm -hmm. or like what are you guys making back there kind of thing and yeah. then they realized that people were interested in their food and i love this story but i hate it too because in what world did we never not want their food right. you know like <laughs> exactly. like that the mexican food that that mexican family was making is incredible from the beginning i'm sure of it 
but they didn't think that's what people who looked like me wanted. Mm -hmm. And then they learned that wasn't true. How beautiful is that? So they started putting some Mexican dishes on the menu. And the El Phoenix that we all know in our lifetime is, of course, a Mexican restaurant. Right. Known for their well-priced cheese enchiladas. Yeah. You know, like the idea that there ever was Oysters Rockefeller there is hilarious. It is hilarious. <laughs> you would never guess that. Yes. So it's like, I mean, when you say that, you know, it's people who started you yeah. know, making food in their home and then realizing that they made good food. Like, that's the El Phoenix story. Mm -hmm. um, and as it turns out, we do want to eat the wonderful food that people make in their homes. That's how we get a lot of diversity of cuisine in this region. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just fun to connect with people over a meal. Yeah. I have always, I always enjoy that. I think most humans do. And the restaurant industry facilitates that. Absolutely. The home. Yep. So if you're to compare Dallas to some of the other metro areas, like how do you think we stack up in terms of restaurants? That's a great question. So I think it's never been a better time to eat than in Dallas right okay. now. The last five years have been huge for the quality of food and um, and out of town interest in Dallas's culinary offerings. So I'm really proud of, of the food that we have right now. Mm -hmm. Never been better. Dallas has always, Dallas people have always compared themselves, as have other, you know, metro areas, to New York and L.A. when it comes to, like, the gold standard of food. Mm -hmm. I think we've stopped doing that a little bit because that doesn't make a lot of sense. But used to be, like, you know, a restaurateur might think, okay, well, you know, in L.A., you know, these, like, certain kind of taco shops are hot or Nashville hot chicken is hot, even though we're not Nashville. Or, <laughs> yeah. you know, like a gourmet burger should cost $25. That's what's hot. And so we can do it. So we, there used to be a, a like a couple years lag of like following a trend mm -hmm. that was happening in LA and New York. And maybe that still exists. But what we're seeing now is smart people from all over the world who live in Dallas, who are using their own ideas, some of which might mirror what's happening in the United States' two biggest culinary cities, but also that is uniquely ours. Mm -hmm. And so um, when it comes to Texas, there's a whole other discussion of what's the best food city. You know, you, Houston is one of the most interesting international mm -hmm. food cities in the world. Austin, always been an interesting food city and always kind of talked about as a cool place to go eat. San Antonio, a fascinating food city, especially for Mexican food, Tex-Mex, and barbecue. Okay. Which are some of the, my favorite things in the whole world. Right. <laughs> um, and then you've got Dallas, which I think, I was talking to somebody from Austin the other day, and she's like, you know, Dallas is is just still such a steakhouse city. And I was like... That's not true. I would never think that to be That's true. not true. We do have steak here and and good, great Absolutely, steak houses to be sure. sure. But the thought that Dallas is like the television show Dallas, the the big blonde hair <laughs> and the, the ranches and lots of money mm -hmm. um, is is such an outdated thought of this beautiful, international, interesting city oh, yeah. with food from all over the place. And so um, we say on our podcast, you know, that that Dallas is what a world class place to eat. And I don't know if I would have said that 10 years ago, eight mm -hmm. years ago when I was also covering food in this town. But I say the last five years have been huge for Dallas and tangentially for its suburbs when it comes to the kind of food you can eat here. And so I'd hold it up against the other Texas cities for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say when it comes to the United States, you know, L.A. and New York are always going to have a heat map on and top of that. huge, too. But um, Dallas is right up there with other big cities when it comes to interesting food. Hmm. You know, we talk about Chicago. We talk about Boston. We can talk about Miami and, you know, even Vegas and Dallas all in the same breath. Yeah. It's funny to think of Dallas and Vegas in the same breath. Uh, well, but, you know what, though? <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. I absolutely agree. But I went to Vegas, uh, let's see, maybe a year ago. And as we were walking the strip, I saw so many restaurants that were either newly in Dallas mm -hmm. or were coming to Dallas. And I, you know, I'm like always looking for the next story. So like I'm walking down the Vegas strip and I've got my my phone out and I'm making notes. Yeah. My husband, I'm like, that place we're gonna get in Dallas in two months, and that place we got, you know, last year, and that place I think we're gonna get next year. And so I made a list. We have at least 13 restaurants that like have a Vegas identity that are in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Like, what's that? Yeah, that is crazy. And I think about this in housing because you have these other major metro areas that are pretty expensive and we pretty much have all the same things to offer yep. in terms of restaurants and culture, yeah. but our cost of living is still lower than in LA, for example. Yeah, I mean, that's sure, a huge selling point. we don't have the point. weather, but like we have everything else, I would say. Well, and the, I mean, 
the weather when it's really hot really stinks. Yeah. But those but of us. That's why we have a big restaurant industry because there's well like, air conditioning. Well, <laughs> and you know, we don't have mountains or oceans, um, but we have the Dallas Cowboys and we have shopping and we have food. Yeah. And uh, and I know that people read the heck out of food news stories. And yeah, I, you you know, have all the analytics to prove yeah, it. Yeah, like we're, we're <laughs> eating in these places too. So restaurants is a pastime in Dallas. But yeah, all those things that you're saying, you know, the lower cost of living, but still so much community, mm-hmm. great schools, like those are selling points to, you know, a region that I am born and raised and still choose to raise my family in. Yeah. Like there's a reason to stay in Dallas and we're just watching so many more people come to Dallas. Yeah. And that- it's better than ever. That's a great way to think about it. It is better than ever. Yeah. It's super cool. So as a food reporter, what's one restaurant that somebody visiting here, a vacation here, has got to try? Ooh, um, I love this question. I like a little bit of a a hidden gem or a place, you know, maybe is off the beaten path. So my favorite place for two people to go right now is Mott Hai Ba. M-O-T-H-A-I-B-A. It is a Vietnamese restaurant in East Dallas. It's tiny. If you eat with more than four people, there's like not room for you to all sit at the same table. <laughs> okay. um, it is it is a smart little restaurant that is neighborhoody and delicious. And interestingly enough, it's a Vietnamese restaurant run by a Serbian chef. Oh wow! So um, there's there's like a story there, right? But I just think that's a cool place to um, to go on a date or even take a colleague that feels kind of special. Mm-hmm. And the food is magnificent. Wow. Okay. Um, but there's lots of local chefs just, who are really smart. Like I love Jose. It is a Mexican restaurant from a really smart female chef. It is on Lover's Lane, um, kind of close to Inwood. Uh, okay. If you were stopping at Love Field Airport, flying in or flying out, you could stop at Jose before or after. It is a it is a fashionable, great little place to get Mexican food, kind of contemporary Mexican mm-hmm. food. Do you want others? Sure. Why not? Let me think. Um, but now we're not just one place. Now, now we're the, the I know. top five places. I know, I know. I should write these down. Um, I love a little place called Bobby's Airway Grill at Preston and Royal right now. Okay. It is American food, and it comes from two people who have uh, came up in the Hillstones Houston's company. So if anybody knew Houston's, which mm-hmm. is now called Hillstone, um, it's high quality American food. And Bobby's Airway Grill has some of that DNA, and it's just... Um, it, it's fun in there. Okay. It's a good place to take a group. I love walking up and down in Legacy West. I really do. Mm-hmm. Um, the Toulouse and Taverna on a on a busy night when the weather is wonderful, mm-hmm. as the people like spill out onto the sidewalk, almost as if you're someplace else. Yeah. Maybe not. Legacy West is it just originally felt out of place for Plano. Yeah. Now now it's part of the identity of yep. Plano, but but it's very urban. Yep. And the, you know the stores there, it's like holy cow, and. It's it's fun, yeah. and you know if if shopping and development is part of the DNA of Dallas Fort Worth, which it absolutely mm-hmm. is, that's that. That's what yeah. Legacy West is. Um, I also think that anybody in DFW who hasn't been to Fort Worth in a while should go. It seems far, and let me tell you, it isn't. It is forty five <laughs> minutes that way, <laughs> right. regardless of where you are, pretty much. Yeah, um, that's true. Whether you're in Plano, it's forty five minutes. No, Dallas is forty five. Some minutes. people are like. You know, they'll drive to Austin for a weekend, but not go to lunch in Fort Worth. And uh-huh. I'm like, you guys, it's a lot closer. Well, I want to take the, I don't know why it is. I just want to take the train to Fort Worth. Yeah. I mean, that's a cool idea, too. So, so where does one go in Fort Worth? I went to lunch there just last week at a place I loved called Walloons. And it is a Walloons. southern seafood spot. I went Friday at lunch and it was like banging. There were people, (laughs) it was so fun. There were people wearing their college football stuff because it was like the first Friday of football season. Um, Drinking at lunch, which is like fun if you can, if your job allows that, I don't Mm -hmm. know. Um, And it was just, it was just upscale seafood. I had a, like a a crock of mussels in a butter white wine sauce. Uh, We started with red fish beignets. So little, um, you know, uh, breaded and fried little nuggets of redfish that were then dipped in like a tartar sauce. Uh, I just loved, the atmosphere was casual yet buzzy. Okay. Um, also, if you're gonna go to Fort Worth, you have to eat barbecue. It is the best barbecue city in Texas, in my opinion. And that is saying something. Well, that is saying something. And I, yes. this is like my my go-to is barbecue. Okay, so uh, Goldie's was named by Texas Monthly as the number one best barbecue restaurant in the state. Okay. And that is off the beaten path south of 30 in Fort Worth. It is run by a, 
a couple of guys in their late 20s who worked for all the barbecue greats in Austin, uh-huh. moved back to DFW where they're from and opened this barbecue joint. It's great, but you will stand in line for well over an hour. And in my opinion, that's part of the experience. Right. Some people don't want to stand in line for barbecue. I kind of do. I feel I, like you have to earn it. I feel like I know I had a great day if I come home and my polo shirt has smells a little bit yes. like barbecue. <laughs> like, no, you carry that around with you yeah, whether you want to yeah, or not. Like for the rest of the afternoon, you're like, oh, I smell like I had barbecue. Yes. Yeah. Um, but Goldie's is among lots of great barbecue okay. places. There's a place called Bricks, B-R-I-X, mm-hmm. barbecue. Um, there's Panther City barbecue. There's there's a couple of old timers over there that are also really good. It's now, barbecue is the one difficult thing that you don't wanna like go on a barbecue tour. Like my yeah. best suggestion, right, is to hit three, just like you would a winery uh-huh. in Napa. But then like everybody's headed toward a meat nap at like 3.30 right, right. p.m. Yes. and everything <laughs> hurts. well to that. Yeah, so I mean, I do that, but I feel as though You're that's just not sampling. right for everybody else. <laughs> so what would be your go-to items at a barbecue place? Okay, um, there's, I think there's an answer to this. It's It's fatty brisket that I just eat with my hands. Uh-huh. If you have to get one thing, get you know a half a pound of brisket and uh, sides can be exciting at a rest at a barbecue yeah, restaurant. Yeah, that's where the so, variety comes in. Yeah, like I love to try their potato salad, coleslaw, mashed potatoes, beans. You can get any of those that you like, but they are not the identifiers of the place. Yeah. So the fatty brisket, if it's a Texas style barbecue restaurant, is is the thing to do. Um, and you're looking for that peppery bark. You want it to pull apart easily. You want it to be juicy. Mm. You need a napkin afterwards. Um, but my kids, when they were little. One of the first like real foods we fed them was barbecue. <laughs> and the reason is you set a little bit of brisket in front of them and they can pull it apart with their hands. And now, of course, we're adults, not children, but I also do that. Mm-hmm. And so I'll sit with um, and, you know, we go and we also order, I think, smoked turkey is a sleeper on every barbecue menu. Interesting. Anybody in your group who wants to eat a little bit healthier, maybe doesn't think that the fatty brisket is their lane. Um a great restaurant should make great, juicy, smoky hmm. turkey. Okay. Um, I prefer not to get a sandwich ever. Yeah, I feel like it's a waste of a barbecue I, Yeah, place. I order meat by the pound or half pound. Um, many of the sandwiches are really good and fun. And, you know, some like pile macaroni and cheese or coleslaw or, you know, you got some True. couple of sauces on there. And that's, it's great for an Instagram picture. But, you know, to <laughs> yeah. me, like the beauty is the smoked meat that took you know, like a single brisket might take 24 man hours. Somebody has to trim it. Mm-hmm. Somebody has to rub it. Um, let it put it in the smoker for you know. It's usually an hour per pound. So if it's a 12 hour All brisket, the we're care talking 12 hours. That. Yeah. Then it has to rest afterwards before you can slice it. Then somebody on the line is slicing it to order for you. I mean, if we care about you know how much time we put into dinner, mm-hmm. that that slice of brisket took. A human, a long time. Almost a day. It's Yeah, and so I think that's really special, and, and brisket is kind of the crown jewel. But, uh, you know, I love burnt ends. Some restaurants are known for their ribs. Mm-hmm. Um, not a lot of restaurants, but a, a great rib yeah, joint. Yeah, I never get ribs at barbecue. You it know, just doesn't make it on my radar screen. It's it's not top of list for me. However, like Stanley's Barbecue in Tyler, Texas, so we're talking about taking just a half-day road trip mm-hmm. east, uh, has, I think, some of the best ribs in the state. Wow. And... Uh, Stanley's barbecue is awesome because they have this cool bar and then they have live music often in this sort of indoor outdoor covered patio space. Yeah. So, I mean, the play is you load everybody up in the car on Saturday morning, you get out there by 11 o'clock, you have a really fun lunch. Um, your driver doesn't drink, your passenger does. Yeah. You know, they have a cool whiskey cocktail or something like that. Uh, you, maybe you listen to some live music, you load everybody up and you're home by three o'clock. Yeah. That sounds like a great Saturday. This is like my week, my perfect weekend is okay. actually driving somebody driving somebody to go eat barbecue. Of Dallas to eat bar- okay. Yeah. I have to be careful because like I think barbecue is my love language and I'll we'll just mm-hmm. we'll just spend another 45 minutes talking about barbecue. Well, there's so many great places and I love that you love barbecue and if, you know, for people who want to understand Dallas food, there are so many cuisines you could show mm-hmm. them. You could show them Mexican food, you could show them Tex-Mex, you could take them to a taco shop, you could show them a fancy steakhouse or you could show them barbecue. I feel like whenever I have people moving here from out of state, I'm always like, let's go grab barbecue. Love I feel it. like that's kind of a trademark Dallas or Texas thing. I absolutely or agree. Or when guests coming in from out of town, I'm like, let's go, let's get barbecue. Yep. Yeah, it's it's ours. Um, and you know, we make barbecue in lots of other cities and and states, and lots of other states do it well. But um, We have our way. You know, yeah, like, I mean, I'm from Texas. We, we are those Texans who like, 
talk about being from Texas. It's uh -huh. a, it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. Yeah. And so, you know, like we're, when I honeymooned in Italy, it's like, we just kept running into Texans and maybe not because there are more Texans than anybody else there, but because we talk about it, right? Because we identified <laughs> right. ourselves as Texans yeah. and we found the others. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like my husband is an Aggie. Birds he wears feather flock together. It, yeah. You can like find your people, but my husband wears an Aggie ring as, as do many Aggies. And of course, you know, at, on his 30th birthday on our honeymoon in Florence at the table next to us are Aggies who notice his ring immediately. <laughs> You know, like Texans just show themselves. Right. And so I do believe that that Texas is a better barbecue state than other barbecue states. And I, you know, I went to school in Missouri, so I ate barbecue in Kansas City yeah, and St. Louis point. a lot. Um, and anywhere we travel in the deep south, we eat their barbecue. There's a lot of good stuff, but we we win if you want my opinion on barbecue. Yeah. Here in Texas. Well, I agree. What do uh, I want to be mindful of your time? You probably have a lunch you're on your way to. <laughs> yes. What uh, What do you wish I would have asked you? I think I want to say that. Every community has something special related to food. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've driven up to Van Alstine to figure out what the food <laughs> is like. This is the next there. hot spot. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've, I've driven over to Salina, which really is the next mm -hmm. hot spot. You know, I've gone to middle of the nowhere um, barbecue places. And uh, f for people thinking about moving to DFW, every neighborhood can be special mm -hmm. if you make it such. You know, there are friendly neighbors, there are cool burger places. Um, there's definitely a good grocery store. We excel at grocery stores, yeah, I feel. That's and, a good point. And yeah. although that doesn't seem like a sexy topic, people have such strong feelings about their grocery store. When HEB <laughs> opened yeah. in DFW, I don't know if there was a bigger news story that week, that month, that year. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I was laughing about that just, this weekend. It's a, such a thing. <laughs> One of my friends who lives near HEB, and he's like, we really don't go there that often. He's like, but it's weird because all these people that are there like drive from other places to come to HEB, I mean, a I'm, grocery store. I'm one of them. Yeah, there we go. No, that's another Saturday outing yeah. is we'll drive like up to you the have grocery to drive store. drive up north here, I think, for now. And like loudly enjoy how much fun we're having. Yeah. You know, it's an hour and a half in yeah. there where we find all kinds of great things to buy. You know, I, I'm i going to love food in a place that's like yeah. in my nature. But um, no, I think, yeah, the, the point is that there are so many cool parts of DFW, uh, I've I've never found somebody who moved here and didn't find their people mm -hmm. and their places. And I haven't lived a lot of other places, so I can't say if that's special to DFW, but I, I just believe that this is a really wonderful place for people to live and eat mm -hmm. and work and send their kids to school. And I do uh, all of those things. Yeah, there's a little something here for everybody. That's right. Yeah, that's what makes it special. Well, Sarah, I really appreciate you taking your time today. If our audience wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to connect? Yes, um, anybody can email me if you have food questions at sblaskovich at dallasnews.com. Okay. Uh, also on Twitter, that's a great place to find what is happening every day in food. My Twitter handle is at sblaskovich, just like the first part of my email address. Um, and then you're welcome to follow me on Instagram or Facebook if you you know type in my name. Um, where in addition to seeing news, you'll also find what I'm eating and what my children are eating and yeah. what my dog looks like. Because I think we're all whole people, mm -hmm. you know. So the things I do on the weekends, though they may not turn into news stories, uh, I think you know make up a a person you know For who sure. is enjoying this region. So yeah. I'd love to connect with anybody. And if you email me, I really will email you back. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Have you been thinking about moving to North Texas? Maybe you're looking in Plano, Dallas, Frisco, or the surrounding communities. Each year, our team helps dozens of families make the move to Texas. We'd love to help you begin your journey. Learn more on our website at hastingsre.com. That's H-A-I-S-T-I-N-G-S-R-E.com.